Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. People settling in their chairs. Lovely to see you all this morning. A warm welcome for joining us for our time of worship this morning. And to those of you online as well, a warm welcome to you too. Although we'd rather see you here, of course. So um, if you could make it to come here, that would be much better. But lovely to have you with us anyway. Um, this week is pretty much as usual, according to, prayer, uh, according to your list there. Prayer meeting on Tuesday, uh, community cafe Wednesday, butterfly on Thursday, butterflies on Thursday, and prayer time at 2 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. So if you can't make the Tuesday evening, you've got an afternoon time there as well. So please try and make one or the other. Um, and then the family service again next week uh, with Pastor Cole. 
succeed in that. Uh, members of prayer this week, Ernie Goddard and Yvonne Gooding, please pray for them. We don't see Yvonne, of course, these days and rarely see Ernie now. But, uh... Oh, yes, please, yes. Yeah, 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 that's good. She'd appreciate your prayers. She'd appreciate it. She'd appreciate your prayers. She's um, in Spring Lodge um, Care Home down at Wolverston. So uh, she'd rather not be there. She'd rather be at home, in her own home. But she's um, looking very much healthy and she hasn't had any falls since she's been there. What she, what she could really do with is being in a place that uh, she's as sharp as a tack, really. Um, she could do is being in a more, what should we say, place that's more appropriate for her sort of socially-wise, I think. But uh, that was the place that she could go into at that time. But, yeah, she'd appreciate your prayers, and I, I sort of go and visit her. Um, yes, uh, what was I going to say? It's a life group this week as well, OK? Life group with Sarah's, 7.30. Anybody's interested, come and see me afterwards. So we have a good time together. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Right, so that's an extra item, then, the life group yeah. on, the, on the notice sheet there. Uh, please pray for others, of course. There's a lot of people there who are unwell. Please remember them in your prayers as well this week. Um, you'll be sad that, uh, to hear that Wendy Clark, that's uh, Valerie's sister, died peacefully last night and went to be with, in glory with Valerie. So good for her, sad for us. So just uh, bear up uh, their family, the whole family, and for um, Paul, of course, as well, uh, very close to the family there as well. So please bear those in mind this week in your prayers. Um, the Renew Women's Ministry, I mentioned it last week, I'll mention it again. It's this Saturday on the 2nd of March uh, at St John's Corbel Hall Road at 10.30 till 12. Uh, that's a, a special ladies' ministry, so ladies, you're all invited to that. There is one of these up on the board at the back with details if you want to have a look at that afterwards. Uh, ladies' Friendship Evening on the 6th of March. Uh, come and hear about Ken's travels. Uh, Ken has been all over the place uh, and... Uh, is, is he the coach driver? Is he? He's not the coach company owner? No. Okay. But he's, he's been around a lot of different places. Uh, and uh, he often likes to talk about his places. And he brings lots of photographs and very interesting. So that's for you ladies on Wednesday the 6th of March here. Uh, if you'd like to come to that, you're very welcome. One of these pink slips here. Sue's got them. If you haven't got one, ask her for one afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Right, we're going to stand up and we're going to go to three different people in the church and just welcome them as they come into the fellowship this morning. So just random people, okay, not, not your best friends. Okay, look around, stand up, and welcome three people randomly and thank them for coming to the church. Okay, let's do that now. Sarah, welcome. <laughs> Your seats, please. <clears throat> okay, yes. I think the problem is once you encourage 
Christians to start to talk, they can't stop. <laughs> they certainly can't count. <laughs> but that's great, that's wonderful. We've greeted each other in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we're now going to spend a few moments listening to some scripture, and then we're going to sing a song, Only a Holy God. Isaiah 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I created you. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let's sing together only a holy God. Be 
Please take your seats and bow your heads. And let's continue our prayers and our praise before the Holy God. Lord, we thank you that you are the Holy One of Israel. We thank you, Father, because you are the Holy God. You are like none other. None other is like you. Even comes close to your glory and your wonder. You're so different to us, Father. We forget this and we often try and define you in the ways we understand and give you human characteristics which limit your glory and limit your power and limit your holiness. Lord, when we look at your love, it's not like human love. Human love, our love, is often so selfish. It's we love people we like. We love people who give us things. Our affection sometimes and often can be covered love. It can be given in order to get something in return. It's love that is, is given to receive. And yet you give love because you are love. Because, Father, you define true love. You love us because you made us. You made us as the objects of your love. You love us because that is who you are. In fact, you loved us, and even though we rejected you and turned our back on you, and all the great things you've given us, we just threw them back in your face, and we were determined to walk away from you. Even in that time of hostility, you gave your most precious thing, your son, Jesus, to put things right. Would we give our children to put things right with our enemy? Would we allow our children to be taken from us and to die in a horrible way, to put things right with people that we do not like, who are opposed to us? I don't think so. Only a holy God. You are a holy God. You want to teach us so much. And we think we know so much, Father, and yet you are the, the giver of life and the giver of truth. And Lord, help us to see that, to recognize if we want to know truth, it is knowing a holy God. He's going to connect him to a God who made this world so he can explain everything about it far more than any of our human friends. No matter how many PhDs and degrees they have behind their name, it's only a holy God that makes sense of this life. Only a holy God that's truly worthy of our praise and glory. Only a holy God that's truly worth following. Because, Father, you lead us into truth. You lead us into that life that you designed for us because you made us. We are your creation. So far as we come into this place, this morning we just pray you may bless us by your Holy Spirit. That you may reveal your holiness through your Spirit to each one of us. And Lord, help us to hear this morning. Help us to see this morning. Help us to grow this morning. Help us to be comforted and encouraged and challenged if necessary, but brought closer to you, the Holy God. Bless this time, Lord Jesus, because we gather here in your name, to your glory. Amen. I'm going to ask the boys and girls to come out the front and uh, need your help. Jolly good, well done. Okay, so the question we have today before us is this beautiful sheep behind me, how to be a good sheep. It's a good time of year actually to go down to find some fields because we're in two or three weeks of the, the new, newborn sheep becoming to frolic around, around the fields. I love that. I used to love going to see Trevor and Sarah's house. They lived in um, Friday Street and they, they, used to, they used to have just opposite their house, they had a little cottage. There was this big field in, in Easter time or in springtime. They used to have lots of sheep and we used to see the little lambs frolicking around. Um, uh, these lovely, beautiful. But the question is, how can we be a good sheep? The Bible, Jesus talks to us, and he says this, he says, look, he says, I am the good shepherd, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. They follow me. Jesus knows his sheep. His sheep know Jesus. Now, how do you listen? How do you listen? But anyway, that's right, read the Bible, listen to what the Bible says. That's good, yeah? That's one way of listening, that's good. How else do you listen? You should be asking this question of the best listeners in the church. Husbands. <laughs> How do you listen to your wives? No, perhaps not. That's perhaps not a good, good way to go down there. <laughs> okay. What's that? Sorry? 
Both were, that's right, yes. Yes, if you want to be a good sheep. But ha- you listen, actually, by trying to keep your ears open. Now, I want a volunteer. Who's going to be a volunteer? You can be, okay, come out here. That'd be lovely. Right. I'm not going to play any music, but I'm going to put these on your head, okay? Okay. I want to see, I'm going to see if you can actually, I'm going to tell you to do a few things, okay? And I want to see if you can hear me telling them, okay? okay. Oh, oh, oh dear. <laughs> see, it's for a big head like mine, not a big head, like a small head like yours. Right, this is actually, if you can turn these on. That fits in, that's better, okay. What's your name? Scarlett. Okay, Scarlett, can you turn to the left, please? Walk in the left direction. Can you turn around? Walk towards me? This is not working as I planned. I'm afraid they've run out of power. I didn't realize they run out of power. Thank you. These are actually noise. These are meant to be cancelling the noise. You shouldn't be able to hear my voice. And you can hear my voice, which means the battery's run out. So, okay, thank you. But the way you, the way actually you, you follow, but Jesus, Jesus says he knows our, what does he know about us? The Bible will say, we read it earlier on, Jesus knows our, our, Oh, he didn't say it there, sorry. It says in John 14, it says, um, John 10, it says that Jesus knows our name. What's your name? Ezra. So Jesus knows what name? Ezra, that's right. What's your name? Abigail. So Jesus knows... That's right, what's your name? Bernadette. So Jesus knows... What name? Bernadette. Bernie, that's right. He knows all our names, from the adults to the children. He knows our names because Jesus wants, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. He calls our name, and if we've got headphones on playing our music, our favourite band, we won't be able to hear him speak. But we mustn't wear headphones, of course you can wear headphones at times. But in terms of our relationship, we've got to learn to listen to Jesus. To try and hear, and keeping our ears open. And the other important thing about hearing people is anything in it, what's important? Now, if you want to hear someone speak, where do you need to be? Any ideas, Scarlett? Yeah. Okay, that's a really good advice. Thank you, Scarlett, that's really good advice. Thank you. The important thing when you want to speak to someone I'm speaking to you because I am in the same room. If I was outside in another house down the street, further down Highfield Road, you would better hear me, would you? No. And so you need to stay close. You need to stay close. We need to be listening to Jesus. One reason we listen to Jesus when we pray to him is to spend some time quietly and just think, we had a whole day on Thursday, a prayer day organised by Lorna in the church. It was great because got lots of time to listen to the Lord, lots of time to speak to the Lord. People often think that praying is just talking. It's not just talking, it's speaking and listening, just like a conversation. We have a conversation with God. You know, if you go to a friend who doesn't listen, just talks to you all the time, that can be a bit, get a bit annoying, can't it? You just sit down there and they just want to tell you their life story and just, they don't stop talking, all they do is talk and they don't, they don't hear anything about you and you begin to think, oh, they don't really care about me very much, they just want to talk about themselves. Conversation is two-way, and talking to God and knowing Jesus is two-way. We talk and we listen, but also we need to stay close, because that way we can follow him as sheep. There's no point trying to follow Jesus if he's in another place. We need to make sure we're in the same place as the Lord and keep close. Jesus knows us by name. He knows us by name. Stay close to him. Keep your ears open and follow him closely. Let's pray. Lord, we just pray you may 
Help each one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, Lord, to learn to stay close to you. Not allow you to get too far ahead of us, Lord, but as a good sheep to stay close to the shepherd. And Lord, to keep our ears open so we can hear your direction. Tell us to go to the left or to the right or to stop or to move. Lord, help us to keep our eyes open, to stay close to you, Lord, that we may follow you wherever you lead us because you always lead us into good posture. Lord, make it so we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well done, boys and girls. You can sit down. I need to charge my batteries up again. And we're going to now have a couple of songs from the band. Thank you.
take your seats. The boys and girls, they're going to go out now to their classes. So the boys and girls go into their classes. Just follow Robin. Oh. <laughs> I think Sue's trying to skip to Baloo there. <laughs> We're going to read together from Nehemiah chapter 6, the book of Nehemiah chapter 6, and read from verses 1 to verse 19 of that chapter. We've been going through um, the book of Nehemiah, this is our sixth um, look at Nehemiah, the book, Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to verse 19. Verse 1 to 19, and we're reading from the New International Version. Here it is written... When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, sorry, okay, Um, let me start again. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not yet set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Aho. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and to go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sambalit sent his aide to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter, in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building up the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up in your, out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will go weak for the work and they will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. One day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mahitabel, who was shut in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because of Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. 
he had been hired to intimidate me. So I will commit a sin by doing this. And then they will give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God. Because of what they have done, remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the war was completed on the 25th of Ulu in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under an oath to him since he was the son-in-law, sorry, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Ara, and his son, Jehohanan. He had married the daughter of Meshullam, son of Barakiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I had said. And Tobiah sent, message, sent letters to intimidate. May God bless to us that reading of his word. It's a really important chapter in Nehemiah, but it's not an easy chapter. It doesn't flow particularly very well. We believe it was part of what was being called Nehemiah's memoirs. Um, and the whole book of Nehemiah is made up with lots of his memoirs with different bit, bits put into it. So it's not very easy to understand. But before we look at that in detail, who's heard of I'm a celebrity, get me out of here? A few of you, okay. Who actually watches I'm a celebrity, get me out of here? Let's have a look. A few of you watch it, okay. Okay, I've watched bit, bits and pieces of it. Can you remember 19, uh, sorry, 1920, 19, just before COVID, there was a, a lady from EastEnders called Jacqueline Jossa, a former EastEnders uh, uh, character, I don't know what she sent us, I don't know what part she played, but she actually um, had one of the worst ever Bush Tucker trials. The whole idea of I'm supposed to be getting out of here is these characters, you know, celebrities, are subjected to terrible trials called Bush Tucker trials, <laughs> somewhere in the middle of, um, in the middle of uh, the, uh, uh, an Australian forest or a uh, uh, jungle, and um, if they want the, the pain and the suffering to stop at any moment, they can shout out, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, and that's their golden ticket to end the suffering, and they get on a helicopter and are flown back to civilization, and they get clean sheets, decent meals, and a chance to have a shower. So they can, the ending can shop simply by crying out those words, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Because they cry out those words, they leave the show, they, they don't win the prize, and of course they can't win the, the Bush Tucker trials but they, they go through in order to win prizes, food and treats, but not only for themselves, but also for members of the group. So this is from 1990, uh, uh, so this is from 2019, the final trial before the end of the show with, Jos, uh, with Jocelyn Joshua. Can we have the volume up, please? Sorry. We've got 51 Thank you. huntsman spiders. Oh. 50 spiders placed on your head. No! Then the time will start. After a minute, the ranger will place the final spider in your mouth. No! Come on, Jack, two minutes. <laughs> this is for your treats. This is for your special treats. Come on. Your last one. Two final minutes. Rangers. Ten seconds. 
five, four, three, two, one. Ridges. Right, stay still, Jack. We'll get them off here. Take it easy, take, take it, it easy, easy, nice and easy. slow. Nice, easy, nice, oh and nice. nice and slow. Step out, well done. Would you do that for, a, I don't know, 50,000 pounds, whatever it is, or the fame of that, would you do that? How many of you would shout out those words, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. But now 51, <laughs> well, you're not a celebrity. Okay. <laughs> So not very pleasant at all. But yet, as Christians, we often assume and we go through difficult times that somehow God gives us a golden ticket. But somehow we've got the ability to shout out, I'm a Christian, get me out of here. I should not be going through this difficulty. I should not have this pain. I should not have this inconvenience. I should not be facing this suffering because I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I'm a Christian, get me out of here. And I think that must have been on Nehemiah's mind, not that they had, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here in those days. But the idea is, why am I going through this? And yet he doesn't cry to God to get him out of there. He uses the opportunities that God has given him, even through the difficulties, to work towards God's kingdom. And in Nehemiah, in chapter 6, we find that suddenly the whole tenor of the, of the attacks of the enemy has changed. Up until now, the enemy, Sambayat, Tobiah, and Gisham the Arab, have been trying to attack the builders, <coughs> trying to intimidate the builders as a whole. But suddenly, in chapter 6, it becomes very personal. And the gates are just about to go on the walls. The walls have been sealed up. The walls are finished. The opportunity they have to attack Jerusalem is coming towards an end. And so now what they decide to do is attack the man. Attack the person. Attack Nehemiah himself. And so we see in this passage a series of plots. A series of plots. It begins in verses 1 to 2. With this, it says, When word came to Sambalit, Tobiah, and Gisham the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, who well, after that time I had not yet set the doors and the gates, Sambalit and Gisham sent me this message, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Honor. These men, the enemies of the people of Israel, suddenly realized the opportunity, the opportunity, the gate was closing, and so now they've got to try and get Nehemiah out of the gate to come to them. They can no longer attack him in the city because the city is beginning to be really well defended. The walls are now built, the gates are just about to be hung. The only opportunity they've got to attack Nehemiah is to get him to come out on the other side of the defences. It becomes very personal. And the first attack we see here is to woo. Not the attack of, not the attack of uh, Al, but to woo means the attack of trying to su suggest friendship, to draw someone in because of friendship. We're told that Sam Ballard and Gisham sent this message, come, let us meet together. Come on, Nehemiah, let's, let's bygones be bygones. Come out of Jerusalem, come and see us. We're, we're choose a neutral venue, come and see us. We're, we need to talk, come on, let's talk. It's a gesture of friendship. It's a gesture of a, that he will leave the security of Jerusalem and come out. But Nehemiah smells a rat. He thinks there's something not right about this invitation. For a start, if it's so important that they want to meet with me, then why, come, why not come and meet with me in Jerusalem? Why not come into the city and sit down with me and we can break bread and we can have a conversation? That's the first rat he begins to sense. But they say to him quite specifically, let's meet together in the village in the plains of Ono. It's interesting that on the surface it seems like a fairly reasonable suggestion because the plains of Ono were literally equidistant between Jerusalem and Samaria and Sambalat was the governor of Samaria. So if you were worried to meet in the middle, you would meet round about in that area. The problem was, is that particular area was right on the edge of Samaria and Judea. It was an area that was borderlands. It was, a bit, it was known to be a bit like the Wild West. 
There was no really good cities or decent villages around that would bring security to the area. It was a dangerous place. It was around about 20 miles from Jerusalem. 20 miles. And 20 miles in those days before cars and airplanes and all the rest of it was a day's journey. <coughs> a day's journey there, a day's journey back. He was going to put himself out on a limb if he was to go out there. And he realized that they were scheming to harm him. The gesture of friendship was no more than a gesture to try and get him out of security, out of his safe place. Five times that invitation comes. And five times it is rejected by Nehemiah. And by the fifth time, the the tactics change slightly, because with the fifth time, Sambalit sends an open letter. We're told. And it's a, a friendly letter trying to warn him we're told in verses 6 to 7 this, he says, it's rep- he says an open letter, an open letter, he says, it's reported among the nations, and Gishon says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting a revolt. And he begins to go on to suggest the fact they're building the walls is because they want to establish a separate kingdom to Persia. And that he has already pre-primed all the prophets to declare at a known point that we have a new king in Judea. It's a suggestion that Nehemiah is trying to make himself king, and that's the reason why he's built up the walls of Jerusalem to p- prepare for this revolt. So Nehemiah is saying, Nehemiah is a fellow governor. You're the governor of uh, uh, Judah. I'm the governor of Samaria. Let's get together. Let's talk about this. I've heard these rumors. Gishon the Arab saying it's true. I don't want to believe them. Let's talk about this before the king of Persia finds out. He's trying to be an old soldier, they used to say, trying to be a mate, trying to be a buddy, one governor to the other, warning, giving them the gypsy's whisper, this could be happening, listen to me, let's meet together. He's scheming, offering to warn, but actually he's doing more difficult, uh, has got another plan, because he doesn't really want to warn, he wants to wreck. And Nehemiah sees this, and he says, they were scheming to harm me. How does he know? How does he know they're scheming? Well, first, it was the character of Sam Ballard, the character of Tobiah, the character of Gisha and the Arabs. You see, this is not the first time Nehemiah's had contact with them. He's had experience of these free men. And he knows that in the past, all they've done is to scheme to bring down, to stop the rebuilding. He, they've got history. He looks at the history and thinks, is what they're saying now true? It doesn't stack up. His experience is not that they're trustworthy, but is that they're schemers. They don't want the Judea to become strong. They don't want Jerusalem to be, defense, uh, to, to be defendable. They don't want the prosperity of Israel. So he looks at their character and his experience tells him not to trust them. And secondly, as I said to you earlier on, um, if it was a genuine invitation, why doesn't St. Ballot come to me? I'm busy. I've said five times I'm busy. Why doesn't he come to be? But they insist we meet in this dangerous border lands area. Thirdly, if Sanballat really believes that Nehemiah is a rebel, why on earth would we want to have a secret meeting with him? If, 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 if um, Sanballat's worried that the news is going to get back to Persia and the Persian king, Artaxerxes, is going to find out about this potential rebellion situation, why would Sanballat be wanting to set up a secret meeting with a potential rebel? It will put Sam Ballard and Samaria in a bad light, like they're conspiring together against Samaria. But lastly, the clincher is this. Sam Ballard sent Nehemiah an unsealed letter. We have, we've all heard of the term an open letter. People sometimes send an open letter to the editor of the Times. And the idea of an open letter is exactly that. An open letter is a letter that's not sealed. When we send modern letters, we seal them, of course, with sticky um, you know, you used to lick them, but now they can pull a piece of paper off and it's got glue that seals the letter together. So you do that in order to prevent that letter being read by someone else. 
that letter is sealed. In ancient times, it was far harder. When you sealed, you used either clay or you used wax, and you put a clay or wax mark on, on the letter, sealing it shut, and you used your ring or a special marker that had your house on, your, the emblem of your name, and you sealed it shut. And the only way for that letter to be open was to break the wax or break the clay seal. And then when you break it, of course, it's impossible to reseal it because it's impossible to remelt wax without having the original seal to make the impression. The fact that Sanballat had sent Nehemiah a letter that was an open letter tells us that he wanted everyone to read it. The courier, the courier's mates, the courier's friends down the pub, everyone could open this letter and spread the rumour further. Further than that, more than that, it was the fact that Sam Bank didn't put his seal on it, was saying he wanted deniability. He wanted this later time to say, well, it wasn't my letter, I have sent it, it hasn't got my seal on it. Sam Ballot was playing a political game. It was an open letter. So why would Sam Ballot send Nehemiah an open letter that could be read by anyone about a secret meeting? If it was a secret meeting, you'd want it to be sealed. You want the information to be kept secret. Nehemiah knew the character of Sam Ballot. He knew he wasn't reliable. He knew he was against him. And the evidence was there before him in this open, unsealed letter. He realized that Sam Ballot wasn't for him. You know, we need to wise up as Christians and to realize the way the enemy works. In the modern day and age, many people, Christians, treat sin as if it's something, mm, it's not good necessarily, but it's not that bad. It's a bit naughty, really. We've got this idea of naughtiness. Sin is never naughty. Sin is actual rebellion against God and what God wants. And the reason God doesn't want us to do these things that he, the Bible talks about as being wrong is not because God wants to deny you. God wants to protect you. Think of when you, when you had little children as parents. You know, if a child wants to put their fingers in the socket, the electrical socket, we don't just turn the socket off, do we? We take the child away from the socket. We tell them that's dangerous and that's bad. And if they put their fingers into the socket, it's not going to be a good experience. It could be a lethal experience. We do that not because we want to deny the child fun and the chance of getting a perm. We do it because we want to preserve that child's life. Same with go out in the park. And you, and, you, and, you, and, you, you know, and you see some, things on the, uh, some of the, the, the um, things in the park that could be dangerous. We may want to stop a ch child climbing a tree or going too high in a tree. We want to stop a child running out on the road. These aren't trying to spoil the child's fun, but us, by experience, as grown-ups, know that that activity ultimately isn't fun. It can be dangerous. It can be lethal. And when God tells us not to do things, it's because he loves us. But so often... We treat the enemy, Satan, when he whispers and tries to encourage us to do wrong things, we don't treat him as the enemy. We treat him as someone who perhaps can be at fun at times, a bit edgy, a bit of an edgy friend. Not the best friend to have, but an edgy friend. Satan wants to destroy us. As Nehemiah recognized the enemy, he recognized the enemy was scheming to hurt him, to harm him. And Satan schemes to harm us. When we get invitations to friendships or relationships that we are unsure about because we don't know where it's coming from and we suspect it may be a bad relationship, do not go down that way. Do not have friends who are going to pull you away from the Lord, who are going to encourage you to do things you know are wrong just because they're edgy and they can be exciting to be with. They are scheming to harm you. Some enemy, sometimes the enemy's skill is to try and get people out of the church, out of the security of the church. You've got Christians who say, you don't need to go to church, you don't need to be in church to be a Christian. You can be in church anywhere. Well, you can be, you can be with God anywhere, absolutely. You can pray on the highest mountain, you can pray in the deepest ocean, God is there. But church actually means a meeting. It means a gathering. And you can't gather with other Christians if you're not gathering with other Christians. You can't be on your Todd on a golf course playing golfing, I'm doing my church, because that's not church. Church is with other people. That's what the word ecclesia means in the Greek. It means an assembly. The, 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 other, the other word in the Old Testament, synagogue, eh? 
synagogue, a synagogue, also means a gathering. It's not about a building. It's about being with believers, those who know the Lord. Why? Because that's where you're secure and able to grow and grow strong. You know, Satan isn't our friend. And in this whole passage, we see the enemy trying to become the friend of Nehemiah, to draw him out of Jerusalem so that he could harm him. The Bible says this. It says, it says, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. God is a holy God, we heard earlier on, and we are to be holy people. Not weird, but different. Different standards. We're meant to represent light and not darkness. And when this original um, plot doesn't work, plot two comes into being, and plot two is very different. You know, Satan's very cunning, the enemy's very cunning. So now, the temptation to Nehemiah, the plot involves apparently so-called holy people. And he gets an invitation to go and meet with Shehemiah, who is a known prophet throughout um, Jerusalem. We don't know anything about him, really. There's nothing in the rest of the Bible about Shehemiah. We only know of his instance in the life of Nehemiah. And Shehemiah somehow is actually unable to leave his house. We don't know why. There's no, there's no in, in, uh, information about that in the book at all. Um, the suggestion, perhaps, is that he may have been ceremonially unclean. He may have cut himself or, or recently suffered a bereavement, which meant that he couldn't leave his house. He was, for seven days, he had to be around his home. There were certain laws in regards to that that applied um, to, to, to Jewish people. But he invites Nehemiah to come into his home so he can give a prophecy to Nehemiah. And when Nehemiah comes into his home, he gives his prophecy, we're told here, he says towards the end, he says, um, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. This is a prophecy. He's saying to Nehemiah, God has told me that you're in danger. God has told me that men are coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you. So Nehemiah, we've got to go. God has said we've got to go to the temple and shut the doors behind us. It's the old idea of finding sanctuary next to the altar in a holy place. He claims to be speaking on behalf of God. But again, Nehemiah begins to smell another rat. First reason for this is because Nehemiah has been told to run. And he doesn't believe, he's been saying to the people, let's stand against the enemy. Let's not run away, let's stand against their threat. Let's rebuild the walls. And he's saying, if I run away now, I'm going to give a bad example. And given a bad example, people are going to be discouraged. I cannot run away. But secondly, he senses something in what Shemaiah says. He says, should a man like me run away or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. And then he says, I realize that God had not sent him, that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hide. What was the clue? What gave uh, the um, Shehemiah Sh away? What gave Shehemiah away was this. He claimed to be speaking from God and yet contradicted what God said elsewhere in the Bible. He claimed to be speaking to Nehemiah, encouraging him to find safety, but by finding safety in the temple, he was saying to Nehemiah, you must do what the Bible forbids you doing. You see, God never contradicts himself. And if any Christian ever says to you, and, and tells you you should do something that the Bible says you should not do, listen to the Bible, because the enemy is trying to get it. God doesn't contradict himself, contradict himself. God hasn't got Alzheimer's or a bit of dementia. I know he's been around for millions and millions of years. He hasn't got that. He is truth. He is perfect. And God will never tell us to do something that the Bible elsewhere says we should not be doing. That's the evidence of a false prophet. That's the evidence of someone who doesn't speak on behalf of God. God had made it quite clear in the Old Testament but no one was to go into the temple and work next to the altar except the Levites and the priests. Numbers 18 says exactly that. And then later on we're told that um, uh, when Moses, who was allowed to go close to God, 
in, uh, in Exodus 20. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Only God was allowed to come towards God. Uh, only Moses was allowed to come into the presence of God because God had allowed that. God said to Moses later on, he said this, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. The only people allowed to go into the inner sanctum of the temple were the priests and the Levites. No one else. And Nehemiah knew this. And he suddenly realized that what this, what this prophet was trying to do was to embarrass him at best, but to have him killed at worst. The Bible says in Nehemiah 18 verse 7 this, anyone else who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. The prophet was saying, go near the sanctuary, you will be safe. The Bible says, go near the sanctuary and you aren't a priest and you're a prophet, you'll be put to death. There was a contradiction. And Nehemiah realized this. And so refused to be intimidated. And that's the thing. We look at this passage, it's slightly confusing because you've got various things happening, slightly busy. You'll see a theme three times in the book of Nehemiah chapter 6. Three times it talks about the enemy trying to intimidate him. First, first in verse 9, it says this, They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak, for the work will not be completed. Verse 14, Remember also the prophet Noadiah, and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. And finally, verse 19, Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. The enemy tries to intimidate us when we're working for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He tries to scare us. He tries to stop us working. We see this through all the plots. All the plots in this passage were trying to scare Nehemiah from carrying on the work because the enemy did not want the work to continue. These are, the same, these are the same tactics that Satan uses today to actually stop modern Christians. Intimidation, fear, worry, concern. He tries to frighten us into activity, like that rabbit in the, eye, in, in the lights, headlights of a car. What does a rabbit do? It, it sees the car coming, and rather than running to the left or running to the right, it just freezes. The very moment it needs to have more activity than ever. Satan tries to intimidate us. But you know, when you read this passage, you don't just see a picture of the enemy trying to intimidate and scare Nehemiah. You get a picture of an enemy that's powerless. Why is the enemy plotting like this? Why is it trying to get Nehemiah out to the remote borderless territory? It's because Sambalat, Tobiah, and Gisham the Arab know that they cannot attack the city of Jerusalem. They know that if they were to do that, they would incur the wrath themselves of the Persian king, Artaxerxes. Because Nehemiah arrives to do this job with a letter from the king, with the king's permission. Not only that, the king sends cavalry alongside him, a defensive force that are with him all the way through this period in Jerusalem for these first 12 years. He's got a detachment of the king's own um, soldiery to protect him in this job. And the enemy know that they cannot attack him physically out front. They're going to attack him, they've got to drag him out of the city into some remote place where no one can see. Probably do it at night and then deny any involvement with it. They are powerless. And what we need to understand as Christians, brothers and sisters, is that Satan ultimately has no hold over your life. He doesn't. When Jesus died for you, you were bought. You don't belong to him. You belong to Jesus. That's what the Bible tells us. You become in Christ Jesus. Not in the devil or in Satan. You are in Christ Jesus. You own the own name of Jesus. You are protected by the king. And he is powerless. So what he tries to do is like a, like a dog on a, on a very tight lead. He comes and barks and shouts and he's slavering. There's bits of you know, slobber going everywhere, and he's there kind of doing this, but that chain stops him doing anything. This is what the Bible tells us. 
You, dear children, are from God. You have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And Nehemiah knew that Sambalat and his cronies were powerless. He knew he was safe as he stayed within the walls. He knew he had that letter from the king of Persia. He had the power of the letter of the king of Persia. He knew he wasn't a rebel. He knew these, these rumours were just lies and made up in the head of Sambalat. He knew that Sambalat had no power. You know, when we face temptation, brothers and sisters, do not listen to the lies of Satan. Satan will tell you, you cannot resist. You are powerless. And that's not true. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, but there's no temptation that you have faced that Christ has not himself faced up to and that he will give you a way out. That's the promise of Scripture. When you face temptation, God will always give you a way out. Therefore, if you give in to temptation, it's not because you were powerless, it's because you wanted to give in to temptation. That's what the Bible tells us. You have power. Satan has no claim or rights over you. Resist the devil, says the Bible, and he will flee from you. Elsewhere it talks about Satan being like a roaring lion, remember that? Trying to devour, but when you resist him, this roaring lion becomes a little kitty cat. Scatters away. Because you have the authority of Jesus Christ. You have the authority of the king. And, and Nehemiah knows this. And so what does Nehemiah do? He doesn't give up. He doesn't down tools. He doesn't stop. But he puts his hands together and he talks to God in prayer. So we go from the plots and we see the prayers. And it, goes, it gets confusing slightly because it goes right into the prayers. It's, there's no gap, you know. It doesn't say, and then Nehemiah prays. He just goes straight into his prayer. And the first prayer we see in this passage is a prayer for strength. It's a prayer for strength. He says this. He says, they were trying to frighten us into thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed... Now strengthen my hands. He didn't say, I'm a Christian, get me out of here. He didn't pray, I'm the governor of Samaria, uh, Samaria. I'm the governor of Judea, get me out of here. He didn't write to Archaxerxes and says, I want to come back and be cupbearer to the king, I don't like what this job down here, it's too hard for me, let me back to Babylonia, to Babylon. He simply asked God to give him strength face for difficulties. He says, Lord, strengthen my hands. You know, when the tough gets going, when it gets difficult as a Christian, when life is rocky, when you're facing difficult situations, and all of us are going to face the reality of a body that's dying one day in this life. That's a reality. We don't give up our faith. Our faith should get going. We pray to God to help us, give us strength, to strengthen our hearts, strengthen our hands, to help us remain strong in him. Often God uses difficulties to really train us as a person. I know in my own personal life, but I've grown more through the difficult times I face. When life has been really tough, when it's been really difficult, that is when I've grown. But when I'm comfortable and when life is really easy, that's when I'm likely to become unfit and not very strong as a Christian. God uses difficult times to build his people up, to train them. He prays for strong hands. But also he prays for strong hands for God. And he puts into those strong hands Tobiah, Sambalat, Gisham the Arab and all his enemies. He prays a prayer of judgment upon them. He says, remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. He knew it wasn't his right to take revenge, and revenge is something the Bible says Christians never have. But we can, we can actually pray that those people who do work for evil in our lives, and we give them to God, because one day there will be a judgment. Deuteronomy 32, 35 God says this, it's mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. Psalm 94, verse 1. 
It says this, The Lord is a God who avenges. O God who avenges, shine forth. And then, of course, it says in Romans 12, Paul says, Do not take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, It's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. God is a God of justice. We don't take justice into our hands. That's not our responsibility. But if we've suffered, we can give people to the Lord and say, Lord, I'll leave that in your hands. You deal with that. And we can be sure one day that God will deal with Sambalat, Tobiah, and Gishon the Arab, and all the other evil people we see in the world that bring so much harm to those living in this world of ours. God is a God of justice, and one day there will be a reckoning. And in this passage, in the, following the prayers of Nehemiah, suddenly you come to the climax of the whole book. If you're reading quickly through, uh, reading quickly through Nehemiah 6, you'd miss it. There's no fanfare. There's no trumpet blast. There's no shout. But he says, quite simply, in verse 16, right following this prayer, he says this. Sorry, verse uh, 15, not 16, 15. So the war was completed on the 25th of Elu in 52 days. So in this passage, there's no celebration of it, no fanfare. Suddenly Nehemiah is saying, I prayed for God to give me strength in my hands. I put uh, Sam Ballet, the enemies of God, into the hands of God, and the war was finished. Just an understatement. He, Nehemiah could have been British. And his ability to not state or big up something just said, and the war was completed in 52 days. And what is incredible in this is having said that, he then writes in verse 16 this. I, I thought I put it out there, sorry. Verse 16 says this. It says, When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. In other words, for all the intimidation of the enemy, for all the bluster, bluff and bluster of the enemy, God's will was done, the wall was built. And Satan could do nothing about it. Instead, the intimidation and the fear that he tried to put on the people suddenly came upon the other nations because they saw that God was unable to be, his will was unable to be um, undone and that God proved himself stronger than they. All the threats came down upon their heads. You know, there's a wonderful passage in Matthew 16, when Jesus takes aside a man called Peter, a man who could later deny him three times, and says to him that his name will be come Peter. It's a play on words. Peter and Petros. Petra in, in Greek means rock. And he says, you are Petros, and on this rock I will build my church. Peter, the impetuous fisherman, had no degrees, Spent his life fishing on galleys. A man who always jumped in with both feet without thinking about it. Impetuous man. And yet God took Peter and made him the first leader of the Christian church. You know, and it says elsewhere in the passage, he says, I tell you this, you are Peter, and on this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. The gates of hell shall not overcome, overcome it. Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus is building his church, and the gates of hell will not stop that happening. We're told the war was completed on the 25th of Elu, 52 days later. God has the victory. God is building his church, and no matter what bluff and bluster Satan does, no matter how loud he roars, no matter how he tries to intimidate you, believer, you have the victory in Jesus Christ because you've been bought with a price. You are on the victorious side. I really commend to you committing to memory Colossians 2, verse 15. It's a wonderful passage. It's one of those passages that all of us need to remember because it's a, 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 a verse of victory. 
It says in Colossians 2 verse 15 this. It says in the first verses 13 to 15, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness. We stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. That's the charge sheet saying you're guilty. Jesus takes the charge sheet and he nails it to the cross. And then it says this. It says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When Jesus died for you, when he died for me, he triumphed over Satan. He triumphed. He won. The, the picture there is of a Roman triumph when, when the Roman emperors, uh, emperors would get people to come in to, to, um, into, into Rome and they'd have what was called a triumph. Any general who'd done a great victory would be begging the emperor to give him the, the glory of a triumph. Well, Jesus triumphed over Satan. He defeated, he made a public spectacle of them on the cross which means you and I are on the winning side. That we need to be declaring our victory because Satan is defeated. So stop acting as if you're defeated. In this day and age where we hear so many things about all the changes in our society, we are going towards glory. Jesus is building his kingdom and the gates of hell will not prevail. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are victorious in Christ. Not in yourself, in Christ. And we just stop acting as defeated people and start acting as victorious Christians, praying with power and prayers of faith over the lives of those around us. No matter how much the enemy tried to stop the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem, it happened, and it happened in 52 days. 52 days, four months, in effect. Started in, in, in Easter, finished in September, the end of August. 52 days. And the and nations around were just amazed, and they were scared. And so lastly, in this passage, we see not just the prayers, but we see the players. And this stands as a warning for us all because there are three classes of people in this passage that were playing at something they weren't. They're like actors. And the first we see was Tobiah. And Tobiah claimed to love God. Claimed to love God. He was not what he first appeared. When he comes into the passage, first of all, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, he's described as Tobiah of the Amorites. And you get an idea that he's an Amorite, but he's not an Amorite. Far from being an Amorite. We find that, you know, he's not outside, but he's very much inside. He's not an outsider, but an insider. We believe he's most likely to be a Jew. In fact, we know he had residency, accommodation inside the city of Jerusalem. In fact, he was married into the family of one of the big builders of the city of Jerusalem, Meshelem. Meshelem was his son's father-in-law. The name of that boy, I told you he's a father-in-law in, in, in that verse, the name of his son was Jehohanna. Jehohanna literally means Yahweh has shown mercy. It's a Jewish name. He's got another child, we're told, later on. And the other child also has a Jewish name. A name referring to Yahweh, the, the, the living God. Tobiah was claiming to be something he wasn't. He was claiming to be a follower of Yahweh, a, a follower, a true believer who had residency and friends within the city of Jerusalem. He was claiming to be on the winning side, but he was working against the purposes of God. He was playing at being a worshipper of God. He was playing and pretending at being something he wasn't. Then there's the prophets. And there's the prophets, and they're the people who claim to speak on behalf of God. And yet we have two examples in this passage of prophets who were following prophet rather than prophecy. They were being paid to prophesy against Nehemiah. So Nehemiah writes about 
Shemariah. He says, I realize that God had not sent him, but that, he'd be, that he's prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He was a prophet for hire. Not in the sense of someone who was paid to do the words of God, but he was paid to say whatever the person who bought him asked him to say. He wasn't an honest prophet. He wasn't a true prophet. Very interesting, if you go to Deuteronomy 18, it speaks about the mark of a true prophet. Two things about the mark of a true prophet. First of all, it says in Deuteronomy 18, the true prophet will never speak against what God has said as you should or shouldn't do. Read Deuteronomy 18. The second thing about a true prophet is a true prophet's prophecies always come true. And if the prophet's prophecies don't come true, then they're not a true prophet. And Shehemiah had said that they were coming to kill Nehemiah. And did they turn up? No. No one turned up. Shehemiah was not a prophet of God. He was a lying prophet who had been bought by Tobiah and Sambalat. These prophets were prophets who didn't want to give the message of God. They wanted to give a message that was profitable, that would put money in their pockets. They were playing at being prophets. And lastly, we see the nobles. And the nobles were people who weren't noble. They were the leaders. And it turns out, when we read this chapter towards the end, it turns out that some of these nobles have been plotting and scheming against Nehemiah all the time, from the very, very beginning. They were people who actually weren't on Nehemiah's side. We're told in verse 17, in those days the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept on coming to them. How was Tobiah and Sambalit learning about what was going on inside the city? That's the reason. The nobles were letting him know. They were like spies inside the camp. They were telling Tobiah everything that was going on. And then Tobiah was telling, telling them the things they should be doing to influence the, the city for the good of Sambalit and Tobiah. These were fifth columnists, the, nom- the nobles within the city of Jerusalem. They were playing at being followers of Nehemiah. They were playing at being on Nehemiah's side. They were players. And we need to check ourselves all the time to make sure that we have a heart for the Lord and what the Lord wants to put into our heart like Nehemiah. To make sure that we don't get sidetracked into starting to play the game rather than listen to God and go his way. Check out our hearts. Check out our hearts. You know, in this passage, you've got these three players, Tobiah, the prophets, and the nobles. But all of them are found out. And that's why it's written about in the book of Nehemiah. People, we should never be a player. We should be 100% committed to serving the Lord Jesus. 100% a heart aligned to his will. Let's not play about it. Let's be true. And the wonderful thing is when we're true and we follow and when the people obey, what happens? The walls are rebuilt in 52 days. What's wonderful is that um, the, the, uh, the archaeologist, uh, Catherine Kenyon, she went to uh, uh, do some excavations uh, for about four or five years in Jerusalem in the early 1960s. And she discovered, in, in digging into the walls at the time, around uh, when, when Nehemiah was doing his rebuilding, she discovered that the walls had indeed been rebuilt, and they'd been built very quickly. They hadn't been built fancily. They'd been put up to provide quick security. There was no fanciness about it. It was just no dressing of stones. It was all about quickness and robustness. And this, again, confirms this story as being historically accurate. People, let's go the way of God. Let's not be defeated or intimidated by the temptations and by the roars of Satan because he doesn't have power over your life. Because you are the Lord Jesus. You've been bought with a price. When we go the way of the Lord, people will see the fact that God is with you. They will see in your faith that you believe in something different and they want to know what that is. Real faith lived out in the community is faith that is powerful because people will see the integrity. And likewise in this passage, when it says they realize that this work had been done with the help of God, they will realize that God 
is working in your life because you're doing things that couldn't be done if God wasn't working in your life. We have a powerful God. We are on the victory side. We have a God who can rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days with all the taunts and shoutings and the mocks. The mockery ended up falling on the heads of those who mocked God. That will happen in the future. People that currently mock the church and mock Christians as being weak and the mockery will fall upon their heads because God is building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. There's a wonderful passage to finish on here to recognize that they were scared because they saw the power of God but also to realize this. If God is for us, who can be against us? One of God's name is Almighty God. It means that there's no one more mighty. He is all mighty. He has all the strength there. Let's believe this. Let's not go around the world acting as if we've been defeated, act as if we're losing because we're not. You and I are on the winning side. God is building his church. The walls are going up and the gates of hell shall not prevail again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the story of Nehemiah. And we're only halfway through, Father, the book. And we pray, Father, you may help us to understand the truths and the nuggets of your grace and your goodness in this book. Help us, Lord, to be like Nehemiah, that when the tough gets, when life gets really tough, when it's really difficult, not to give up, but to ask you to strengthen our hands, to enable us to carry on, sometimes to strengthen our knees, to give us strength to walk in your ways, sometimes to strengthen our minds and to help us to think your way, sometimes to strengthen our tongues and help us to speak your truth. Lord, help us. Strengthen each one of us. You know our situations. Be with us, Father. Strengthen us and help us to go your way. Help us not to be intimidated by the taunts and the lies of Satan. Help us, Lord, to trust you because you are the way, the truth, and the life. Truth lies with you, Lord, not with Satan. Help us to listen to your truth and to turn our heads away and stop up our ears to the lies and the make-believe of Satan. And Lord, we think especially of those in the church who right now are going through very difficult times, and we especially bring before you Sandy and ask you, Father, to be with her. We pray, Father God, you may bless her as she's began the radiotherapy on her body. We thank you, Lord, for her faith and for her example of a Christian faith lived well, even in the face of great difficulty. Do bless Sandy, be with her daughters and her son and a wider family. And we pray, Lord, that the medicine and the program of, of treatment that she has will make a big impact in bringing her healing. And we pray especially, Lord, you may give her great strength and peace and hold her at the start. Because, Lord, we ask these in all our prayers. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our final song. It's a lovely song, reminds us that God is our anchor.
Teach me your way, Lord. Make straight the path before me. Do not forsake me. My hope is in you. As I walk through each one of us to rest in your embrace, to grow closer to you, to hear your direction, and to glorify you in our lives as we go the way that you lead us. So bless us now, Lord. Bless us this week. Give us strength, strength in our hands, and bring glory to your name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you've been smelling during the service, the food has been cooked, and I've been told by the kitchen that they want us to go down and sit down as soon as possible. So before you sit down, I'm going to ask Kevin to say grace. And we can go straight into the meal. Thank you. Father, we thank you for your word, which has fed us and strengthened us this morning. Praise you for all that you have done here in this place today. Father, we thank you for those who've been working so hard in the kitchen to provide lunch for us. Thank you for your goodness, dear God. We pray that you would bless this food to us. Bless our time of fellowship together. May we rejoice together in our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has won the victory. Praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.